Nelson Mandela, in his book Long Walk to Freedom, detailed how individualism is constantly taking away. As he said, prison as a system is designed to break your spirit. To accomplish this, authorities focus on taking away your individual abilities to succeed. In apartheid South Africa, black South Africans were banned from numerous rights, but one of the most important was protecting themselves individually. Till 1983, black South Africans were completely banned from owning guns, while white South Africans enjoy the pleasure of having a gun and be able to use it against black South Africans. This ability to own a gun didn't change the plight of South Africans to fight against the government, but it changed the ability to fight against persecution, which they constantly face. But the ability to own a gun and its right has continued and surmounted into numerous guns, millions of them existing in our country. In America, there are over 400 million firearms owned. These firearms have been used to cause mass destruction, school shootings, individual homicides, and suicides. But we must understand what's the root of this gun violence and where it comes from. Numerous politicians, such as President Joe Biden, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and Senator Cory Booker, have all made efforts to outline policies to gun control and solve our crisis. These are some of the policies that they have suggested. But ultimately, out of all of these, only one has stuck and become an actual legislative choice. And that was in 1994, introduced by Charles Schumer, validated by, President, uh, by Senator Joe Biden, and passed under the Clinton administration to ban assault weapons. An assault weapon is simply a weapon that ultimately is defined as one as mass destruction. But in America, when machine guns are banned, semi-automatic rifles are the real assault weapon to ban. A semi-automatic rifle is one that has the ability to reload, as displayed in this video, and reset the trigger after you fire once. It does not fire multiple times when you press a trigger, but it can give an easier ability to shoot a gun. When you have this ease of ability, does it make it better to use? Good afternoon, my name is Stephen Abraham, and this is the effect of semi-automatic weapon access on US public safety. Right now, there are over 20 million AR-15s in circulation, and semi-auto weapons continue to become a more larger issue as more school shootings begin to happen. But are they the root of the problem? Today's research question is to what extent has access to semi-automatic weapons affected American citizen public safety, shaped by violent crime rates among states that allow for open carry since 2004? To figure this out, we must look at the past, present, and future of gun policy. And from reviewing that, I found that semi-automatic weapon access has had no strong impact on violent crime in the United States who have allowed for open carry since 2004. So let's look at the past and the ban of semi-automatics under 1994's Crime Control Act. This ban focused on taking away individual cosmetic items that are linked with semi-automatic weapons, such as flash suppressors and pistol grips. This was a blanket definition to take away all guns of the current and also the future that had these abilities. But this included not just AR-15s and AK-47s, but also semi-automatic handguns, which were constantly used for concealed carry against violence. And among states that had different uh, state laws before this ban, we saw that even if you had a state assault weapons ban, you had a decrease of 7.6% between the years 1992 to 1993. But for states that didn't have this ban, they had a 6.7% decrease in violence as well. This showed that there was no strong correlation before the ban to prove that assault weapons were the problem that caused violence in America. But it wasn't just that that was the issue with the ban. It was also the effect on the gun market. The fact that when these guns were banned, they were in circulation, in surplus. Demand for semi-automatic weapons shot through the roof once this ban went into place. As we can see from this graph, the AR-15 in 1994 rose to extreme demand. Prices went through the roof and people stockpiled on hundreds of thousands of guns. As we enter 1994, there was 150,000 AR-15s. And when we left, there was over 2 million. This is because the demand and illegal circulation brought immense firearms to our country. This is one of the grandfathered guns that was displayed and used in further crime in the late 90s. But it's not just the past, it's the current that makes semi-automatic rifles important. The ability to use in home defense. As we can see from this map, amongst defensive gun use with semi-autos, it's heavily concentrated in urban areas where you can use semi-auto handguns to fight against common everyday crime. 
but in rural areas it's also very prominent. This shows the distinction between the two, that semi-auto rifles are crucial within rural areas, while semi-auto handguns are important within urban areas. Donna White, a black woman living in Charlotte, North Carolina, used a semi-auto handgun to defend against a potential rape threat from a man that was approaching her. The ability to utilize a semi-auto handgun gave her the ability to protect herself, but it's different amongst different regions. And this is why a federal policy decision is not effective for us to use on semi-auto weapons. Right now, we have 500, over 500,000 defensive gun uses since over 2019. That was the minimum estimate by the CDC. And on the flip side, there are 480,000 plus trafficked and stolen firearms. So the supply keeps increasing, whether guns are illegal or legal. But ultimately, the defensive gun usage need is still going to be there. Because simply, people can't be protected by the government. In Charlotte, North Carolina, it takes 14 minutes for police to arrive to protect someone. That is way too long for someone to actually defend themselves. Now, we looked at the future as well, in legal implications. It took over 200 years for guns to be regulated by our government through law. This was only through the District of Columbia versus Heller case that came after the ban that realized that guns were being illegalized amongst numerous states because of the Crime Control Act. This gun ruling finally brought back and restricted cities from completely banning handguns. And this was followed up by the Bruin versus New York State Rifle Association case last year, which validated that states and cities can't just simply rip away the ability to access handguns. So our country and our cities are finding out why handguns are necessary for the future. But it's also tyranny prevention. In the Federalist Papers, it was outlined that this is a common goal. And amongst our different examples, and amongst our different examples, we saw that there were many situations in which tyranny prevention is crucial, not just against the government, but against specific groups, political groups. In 1965, the Deacons for Defense and Justice armed black men to fight against the Ku Klux Klan that, def that defended every single black American who needed to protect themselves against a numerous threat that wasn't just governmental, but political. And amongst other countries, when, when they instituted policy decisions to ensure that they could fight against guns, we saw that these regimes were likely the worst. Most notably, the Nazi regime, which focused on taking out guns entirely. And once they did that, individualism was gone through the roof. This was the plight of Jewish uh, people who were trying to find firearms to utilize. And ultimately, because they couldn't find much, they were constantly eradicated and persecuted. And amongst different countries, they continue to focus on utilizing semi-autos. Switzerland finds ways to utilize semi-autos to ultimately bring forth solutions. These solutions need to focus on regulating ammunition and fighting against lobbying, which is a common limitation of them. It's focused on shifting our gun culture right now to ensure that we don't focus specifically on regulating guns, but focus on ensuring that our people are protected and utilizing guns Paying, paid for by federal funds for training and focus on the purpose of gun ownership, not why or how to operate specifically on guns. They need to focus on the reason behind them having a gun. And finally, the, another important solution that wasn't mentioned here was to focus on restricting access to trafficked guns, which are illegalized and cross the border frequently. We need to focus on border patrol and legal regulations to ensure that our government doesn't allow for illegal guns to kill our people. Thank you. Here are my sources. Any questions? I have two questions for you. Take a step back if you would. Okay. First question, how did, it, how did you handle the differing perspectives that you had in order to reach the conclusion that you came up with? Yeah, so I took the angle of not necessarily looking for nonpartisan sources, but actually bipartisan ones. So I looked for a source from a conservative think tank and a liberal think tank, the Heritage Foundation and Giffords Law Center, both on numerous spectrums of the ability to approach guns. And doing this allowed me to find different statistics that went against each other, and I could compare their implementation on why they're important. For example, defensive gun use was a statistic touted by the Heritage Foundation, but Giffords Law Center focused on illegal guns. So I could use both of those and see which one valued more than the other, because they were both extremely relevant, but I'm glad that I found both from individual sources from different ends of the political spectrum. And last question. If you had more time, what additional research would you have conducted related to this issue? 
Yeah, so I would have focused on the need for guns in specific scenarios. I touched upon domestic violence, but um, the ability to use uh, different rifles in different situations, for example, having a semi-auto rifle at home, how effective is that um, compared to a handgun, for example, in dealing with somebody who is uh, trying to rape you or assault you? Um, and that specific scenario might be more important to find uh, to see where individual rights might be the most beneficial and relevant to our people.